During the Synod, whose theme is young people, the faith and vocational discernment, Pope Francis proclaimed seven new saints from every walk of life. Seven new saints are seven great examples to follow for young people today. In this special episode, we will tell you the stories of three heroic examples of Christian lives. A layman, Nuncio Soprizio, a priest, Vincenzo Romano, and a religious sister, Ignacia Nazaria Mark Mesa. Nuncio Sulpizio was born in April 1817 in the small Italian town of Pesco Sansonesco in Abruzzi. He lost both of his parents while still a child and was brought up by an uncle. Nuncio's uncle then took him on as a blacksmith apprentice, but he was harsh with him, often leaving him without proper nourishment, beating and cursing him. After contracting gangrene in one of his legs, Nuncio was sent to his paternal uncle, Francesco Sulpizio, in Naples. Here, in the then biggest city of Italy, the life of Nuncio had its new beginning, and here, the little lame saint achieved his holiness. Today, the city is just as busy as it was 200 years ago when Nuncio arrived here. People live their lives rushing to finish their daily chores, scurrying through the streets. The Church of San Domenico Soriano is located in one of the central squares in front of the monument of the author of the Divine Comedy, Dante Alighieri. Here, Neapolitans come to meet their Lou Santanello, or Little Saint, in Neapolitan dialect, and entrust him with their prayer requests and to share their sorrows and their joys. Ave Maria, piena di grazia, Signore con te. Tu sei benedetta fra le donne, benedetto il frutto del tuo seno. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi. Nuncio's postulator and parish priest, Father Antonio Paone, says that the spiritual presence and impact of Nuncio Soprizio are very strong here. At times we look at the saints as ideals who do ideology. Nuncio Suprizio, however, inspired and continues to inspire concrete initiatives. Here in this parish, a group of volunteers has been born, called the Fraternity of Blessed Nuncio Suprizio. Among other things, every Monday the members go to various parts of the city to distribute meals and extend a hand to those who live on the streets, sometimes as many as 400 people. His charism to be close to the last ones is still very alive and inspires many. In spite of his illness, Nuncio Sulpizio assisted others who were sick and disabled and, in his poverty, relieved the misery of the poor. When he came to Naples, he was dressed very poorly. There is a record in the hospital for the incurables that lists the clothes that he wore, a small torn blue jacket, a straw hat, and ripped clothes, a three-quarter length trouser, and a broken shirt. In his hand, the rosary and a book of the office of the Blessed Mother. Walking through one of the wealthiest main streets, the nobles who saw him laughed. They didn't know that under those rags there was a hidden noble, destined for the halls of the heavenly kingdom. Ten minutes walk from Piazza Dante, the hospital for the incurables recalls the 21 painful months that Blessed Nuncio spent being treated there for gangrene. La 
la prima cosa che chiese. The first thing that he did there was to make his holy communion. The chaplain at the time records the initial process, recounting that when he received the body of Christ, the young boy turned a strange color and went into ecstasy. He needed waking up. Sognò poi di svegliarlo. Nuncio found his consolation in the Eucharist, the example of the saints, and the rosary, which he had learned from his childhood priests and maternal grandmother, Rosaria. The hospital for the incurables singled him out immediately for his dedication to the sick. He learned to treat those who were worse than him. Once, precisely when attending to a man who was suffering from cancer of the throat, seeing him suffer during the night, he decided to draw close to him and said, now I shall treat you and you'll see that you're better. After the man was examined, the next day, during his checkup with doctors, he was found perfectly healed. The wound in his throat that was killing him had completely disappeared. He would tell the sick, always be with the Lord, because from him comes all that is good. Suffer for the love of God and with joy. Eventually, Nuncio contracted bone cancer. His leg was amputated, but it did not help. He hoped that God might heal him, but he never lost his faith the Lord was guiding him every step of the way. Two months after the amputation, on the day of his death, he asked for a crucifix to be brought to him before summoning his confessor to receive the sacraments for the last time. He died on May 5th, shortly after his 19th birthday. Looking at the life of this boy, one might think that he's a wretch, an unfortunate man, one who didn't know happiness. Of course, the physical sufferings, the moral sufferings, the discomforts, the mistreatments, there were so many and weighed so heavily upon him. But knowing well Nuncio Suprizio, those who want to really come to know him will discover a happy young heart. Nuncio became one of the first people beatified by Pope Saint Paul VI when he was raised to the altars on December 1st, 1963. Before all the world's bishops gathered for the Second Vatican Council, Paul VI said that Nuncio Sulprizio teaches us that the period of youth should not be considered the age of free passions, of inevitable falls, of invincible crises, of decadent pessimism, of harmful selfishness. Rather, he will tell you how being young is a grace. Poi c'è stato un concistoro there was a consistory specially convened for Nuncio Suprizio in July, which I had the honor of participating in, in which the Holy Father, gathering a good group of cardinals, asked and also defined that Nuncio Suprizio should be canonized. We are, above all, in the great year of the young, so our new saint, we can say our future saint, has a great message to give to the young. His message is summarized in the two great loves that marked his life, Jesus and Our Lady, the Eucharist and the Holy Rosary. Mass and prayer to Our Lady, and this he announces to the young in our time that are designated statistically as the new poor. And not only for the crisis of work, but also because they don't yet aspire. They seek short-term happiness without models to imitate. Certainly the Pope has looked at that aspect. He is a patron saint of invalids, as well as blacksmiths and workers. His life shows we must believe and obey the crucified and risen Christ, who makes all things new. We'll be back with more on Vatican.
Vincenzo Romano was born in Torre del Greco, a small town on the Bay of Naples on June 3, 1751, to poor but pious parents. As a child, he became enamored by the writings of St. Alphonsus Liguri and developed a strong devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. He began his studies for the priesthood in Naples at the age of 14 and was ordained a priest at 24. His first assignment was to the Church of Santa Croce in his hometown of Torre del Greco, where he was baptized, served as a priest, and his sacred remains are now kept. The people of Torre del Greco nicknamed Father Vincenzo the Worker Priest due to his tireless outreach to the poor and his commitment to the social needs of all people in the Neapolitan region. Father Vincenzo paid particular attention to promoting a solid Christian formation for all children. He was very dedicated to the proclamation of the gospel, preaching as many as five times at the end of the week. His preaching was simple and was aimed to educate the faithful. A successor of Vincenzo Romano, Monsignor Giosue Lombardo, says that Father Vincenzo anticipated Pope Francis's vision of a church that goes out. What did this young parish priest do? He went onto the streets with the crucifix, standing in front of stores, in front of bars, where people gambled, got drunk. When he started preaching the gospel, the locals listened and gathered around him. He cast the net like a fisherman, a spiritual net. And then, little by little, he brought people into the church, where he continued catechizing them. Today, the people of Torre del Greco continue the mission of their beloved pastor, carrying him in procession through the streets of the city. I think that Pope Francis wants to present to lay people, as well as to the church as a whole, a model of a pastor with the smell of the sheep, because he was always found among his people. Imagine that he never left his parish even for one night. He would say that the sheep cannot be without the shepherd, but he was also perfumed by Christ because he devoted so much time to Eucharistic adoration, not so much time, all the free time that he had. He was in front of the tabernacle. His strong personality as a priest and his love for his parishioners emerges when, on June 15, 1794, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius destroyed most of Torre del Greco as a lava flow swept down to the sea, bringing down the church. These two pillars of the bell tower remained, and when King Ferdinand IV of Bourbon, King of Naples, wanted to take away the people of Torre del Greco because Vesuvius was constantly erupting, the young priest opposed the king, saying, the bell tower has remained, we'll build the church next to it, and around the church, we'll build the city. Romano, then assistant pastor, promoted its reconstruction. Miraculous events seem to accompany it, including the arrival of a ship from Libya loaded with timber, which was offered as a gift for the construction of the roof trusses. No one could explain this act of generosity, nor knew who had commissioned it. There's another beautiful story. Not far from the parish building site, there was a bar where he took wine for the builders. When he went to pay on Saturday, the host said to do so when the wine finishes. The construction of the church finished, but the wine never ran dry. On January 1st, 1825, 
Father Vincenzo fell and fractured his left femur, which began a slow decline in his health. His death at the age of 80 came on December 20th, 1831, after battling a long illness. Paul VI, who was canonized together with Blessed Vincenzo on October 14th, beatified Father Vincenzo during the Second Vatican Council on November 17th, 1963. Two miracles were recognized, the healing of a malignant and aggressive breast tumor and a serious throat ailment that developed into cancer. Both life-threatening diseases disappeared completely upon the intercession of the saintly Vincenzo. For Blessed Romano's canonization on October 14, 2018, the miracle concerns again the cure of an Italian cancer patient. Rosanna Formisano, the daughter of Raimondo Formisano, a beneficiary of the miracle, remembers very well this intense episode in the life of the family. We lived a dramatic experience because our father took sick with a tumor, a malignant cancerous tumor that weighed more than four kilos. The oncologist told us that the situation was serious and we'd arrived too late. Doctors were unable to do anything. Raimundo was dramatically losing weight and strength. The best thing that the family could do was just to pray. There were improvements, but the doctors were highly skeptical until the oncologist said, at this point, I've decided to do a total body examination because maybe there's something on the other side. So we did the total body. I can't describe the applause of the medical team that did the exam. It's a miracle. They were embracing him. We knew nothing. Then the doctor came to ask, Madam, which saint do you have as your protector? And I said, Blessed Vincenzo Romano. You've received a miracle. The tumor has reduced and disappeared. Il tumore è si è ridotto e scomparso. Father Vincenzo Romano is a patron for throat tumors and the Neapolitan priesthood. Stick around for more on Vatican. Nazaria Ignacia was born in Madrid, Spain on January 10, 1889. At the age of 19, she joined the Congregation of the Little Sisters of the Abandoned Elderly in Mexico, where she moved with her family for economic reasons. Four years later, she was sent to Oruro in Bolivia, where she dedicated herself for over 12 years to the care of the elderly. Later, she left the congregation in order to found, with the blessing of the bishops of Aurora and La Paz, the diocesan religious Congregation of the Missionary Sisters of the Pontifical Crusade, a religious institute that was canonically erected on February 12, 1927. From that moment on, the work of Nazaria Ignacia and the first missionaries developed relentlessly in the periphery of Aurora and in the rural mining areas. One of the tasks of the religious was to organize in 1933 the women of the Ororean markets and shops to form what was the first trade union for female workers in Bolivia. 
One of her desires was to raise the dignity of this people, teaching them to work, making them feel that in the hands of all and each individual lies the participation in the beauty, the harmony, the sweetness, and the happiness of knowing oneself to be a son and daughter of God. But Bolivia was not the only country where she served. Nazaria also undertook missionary work in Uruguay, Spain, and Argentina, where on July 6, 1943, she went to the house of the father. In 1972, her remains were transferred to the Bolivian city of Oruro, as she had requested before her death. Nazaria Ignacia understood all too well the importance of reaching those most in need and giving them a dignified life. She was beatified in Rome on September 27, 1992, by Pope St. John Paul II.